Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lincoln Road Chapel Broadcast. Thank you for joining us uh, today. If you're joining us for the very first time, you're most welcome. And I hope you stick with us for these few minutes and you'll be blessed by what you hear. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, uh, our brother uh, Richard uh, preached from the book of Matthew. There's one particular scripture that, you know, uh, stuck with me and I kept, uh, uh, you know, reading it over and trying to understand what the Bible was telling us. Uh, it's in Matthew chapter 5. And uh, it's verse 20. Uh, now, these are the words of our Lord uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Now he says, the Bible reads, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Um, this scripture, I kept, you know, looking at it and, you know, when you look at what the Lord was saying here, it's almost quite a tall order for us, you know, for our righteousness, you know. The, 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 uh, the Lord is saying that unless, if your righteousness, you know, exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, and, and, and these people were pretty much righteous for the Lord to have referred to them, you know, they were at a certain degree of righteousness. And, the, and and here the Lord is saying that, you know, you know, I, I think you cannot reach the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes. I think that is that is telling, you know. Uh, and, uh, and when I think about this scripture over and over again, I meditate on it, it makes me appreciate the salvation that I have. Because the salvation that I have, it is not down to what I have done or how I have worked it out or, you know, or wh what I have uh, tried to do by myself. No, the salvation that I have is freely given. So it made me understand, it made me appreciate much more. Christ here is saying that, yeah, your righteousness, yeah, accept it exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, yeah. And I bet it won't exceed that of the Pharisees and, and scribes. Then you will not enter the kingdom of God. How right is he? And, and we thank God that we can be able to, to approach his throne of grace because of what Jesus did for us. You know, he was the perfect sacrifice for us. And he paid the price for us. Our salvation now is freely given. And freely we receive. Thank you. Shall we just pray now? Father, we give you praise. We give you all the glory and honor. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, uh, that our salvation is because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Father, we give you praise. We thank you that, Lord, you had to lay your life for us, that today, oh God, we can receive that salvation. We can glory in that salvation. We appreciate you, Lord, and we give you praise. We thank you and we ascribe to you the honor and the greatness that is due unto your name. Father, we give you praise. Father, in these few moments that we'll be sharing your word, we pray, mighty God, that, Lord, touch the, the lips of clay of the, of, the, of the person that is sharing your word. Give them clarity of your word, oh God. You speak through them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray, oh God, even for everyone that is tuned into our broadcast today, that Lord God Almighty, you shall give them patience to be able to hear your word. You shall open up their hearts, their minds, oh God, and let the word as it comes find room in their hearts in the mighty name of Jesus. May we all be revived. May we, be, may we all be encouraged by what we hear. In Jesus' mighty name, we do pray with a heart full of thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, how sweet the glorious message, simple faith may claim. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same.
everyone. My name is Moira, for those of you who don't know me. And I've been attending Lincoln Road Chapel for about the last 40 years or so. Um, although I wasn't actually brought up to attend church. So as a child, I really can't remember going to a church service. Um, but I do always remember believing in God and praying. I did attend a Sunday school, but it was only for a short while and I don't remember a thing about it. It wasn't until I was at secondary school and I had a Christian friend there who invited me to a church service that I decided to follow Christ. Now, it was the very first meeting I'd ever been to and I understood very little or nothing about the gospel. But it just seemed to make sense to me that it wasn't enough to just believe that God existed. I had to respond by asking for his forgiveness. Um, it was only as I continued to attend that church, which was in South East London, that I began to understand a little about the gospel. Now, I was only 14 at the time, and I do remember thinking, well, you know, I wasn't that bad. Yes, I needed God's forgiveness. But really, was I that bad? Um, we were reading books at the time about Nicky Cruz and Teen Challenge and gang members and ex-prisoners. And I just thought, well, you know, I haven't done any of those uh, really awful crimes. But as I was attending church, uh, I began to realise that compared to God's standards, I fell far short. And I really did need God's forgiveness and God's love in my life. So I believe it was God's grace that I did respond on that very first visit to church. And I believe it was by God's grace that I continued to attend church. Um, but coming more up to date, during lockdown, um, I'm sure many of you know, that um, I was diagnosed with malignant melanoma and I've been on immunotherapy for the last year, which, praise God, I've had very few side effects. And um, also, praise God, I have just recently heard that I am now free of the cancer and I'm off the treatment. So again, that's by God's grace. But being told you've got cancer, and I remember sitting in the consulting room, being given the percentage chance of me surviving five years, the percentage chance of me surviving 10 years, it does make you think more about your own mortality and more about eternity. And so I can honestly say that uh, this experience has made me more confident in my faith in God, that... Um, I was at peace with God because I knew that whatever happened, I was going to be with him. I do thank you for, to everyone who has prayed. I know um, a lot of people have been praying for me over this last year, and I do thank you. That's made a huge difference. I believe God does answer prayer. And I'm not saying that just because now I'm free of cancer, but because um I do feel, as I say, that God has taught me a lesson during that time and that I can say with confidence I will one day be with him forever. So, uh, yeah, thank you for everyone who has prayed for me over this year or uh, over the years. And I do uh, just say praise God and thank him for his grace. And I pray that I will keep on following the Lord, growing to love him more and more each day. Thank you. Jibale ko, that's a common Ugandan greeting, and it means well done. Uh, but being Ugandans, and they're a bit like uh, British, in as much as they like to understate things, it actually means well done a bit. So well done a bit for your interest in our street kids and your very much appreciated support. Here's the latest uh, update. Uh, we call the uh, boys the Subis. We call the project House of Hope where they live and so hope in Luganda is Subi. It's uh, a reasonably common name so we call them the Subis 
uh, rather than, of course, calling them the street kids. And our latest report is they had a good, hearty meal at Christmas, probably the first proper Christmas meal they've had, and they were able to celebrate and have a lovely day together. We also took them for a Ugandan-style Christmas treat, which was to go swimming, uh, probably for uh, many of them the first time they'd gone swimming in a swimming pool. And again, they really enjoyed it. And what, what I really appreciated was in the photos that were sent to me uh, for the swimming trip, uh, how smart they looked, how healthy they looked, how they had uh, bulked out a bit and looking so much better than uh, when we first found them when they were dressed in rags and, and skinny. And uh, just lovely pictures, hopefully you're seeing them of them at the swimming pool. Um, and Calvin, who is uh, the one who's in charge out there, he says how they've really seemed to have settled and the, the quarrels that were there to start with when they were a bit insecure uh, seem, seem to have gone and they've just settled and are secure and know they're accepted, know it's permanent after about 10 months. And so it's so good to see the progress and they're involved in church and they're hearing the gospel. And so we're really encouraged by uh, what we're seeing happening there and they can continue to get a healthy meal with fresh fruit and vegetables and meat and, uh, and and all the things they need as well as the medical care and uh, uh, good clothes. They're just starting uh, at school. Uh, many of them can't read or write. They didn't really go to school, many of them. And uh, so they're starting in the church school. Uh, the schools have been closed in Uganda basically since the start of COVID. And so uh, they're just reopening now. So th th they're going to start there and the, the whole business of wearing uniforms and being in a properly organized and regimented school, um, although they're, they're day pupils, um, that, that will do them the world of good as well. The chicken house is up and we're just finishing off some bits and pieces ready to get them uh, some hem hens and to get um, perhaps some, some rabbits as well for them to keep another little interest. In, another little interest. We're just finalizing the design for their new house where they're going to live and uh, we, we, we need to get planning permission for that. It has three dorms, a lovely big uh, common room, uh, staff quarters uh, and all the things that they need. So we're just praying that that will quickly get finished. Things can go up very quickly in Uganda compared with here because um, builders are always looking for work. So today you want to build a house, tomorrow it goes up. It's in, in the outskirts of um, it's in a rural area, but it's within officially city bounds, so we have to get planning permission. But we're praying that that will go through fairly quickly. Another uh, sort of final thing to uh, mention about our Ugandan work. We also uh, sponsor 17, uh, about 17 probably more, children through uh, school and then university when they've got through school. And these are ones from the church that we've been involved with and uh, ones we've got to know. So about 17 uh, Christian young people who we also sponsor through university, uh, through school and then university. I just had a, a lovely message uh, from one of them and uh, just, just uh, she, she's now at university. We put, put her through the last years of school and just such a lovely message thanking us for taking care. She says, I, I, I cry when I think about how much you've cared for, for me and my family. And there are four in the family. She largely brought them up, her younger siblings herself. Um, the father had left them. Uh, they were abandoned. Um, the mother uh, works in a shop to, to earn enough to, to give them just, just enough to, to, to eat, as it were. Um, this girl had to bring them up on her own because her mother has to live somewhere else because there's not room in the little little house that they've been living in for the mother. Um, but she was so grateful, so appreciative and uh, just a lovely, uh, godly family who are um, seeking to go on with their lives and, and, and serve God. Uh, so um, uh, 17 children, all the age from about 10 up into 24, one is at YMCA learning secretarial schools uh, as skills. One is um, at university studying law. Uh, boy, with particular promise, he's a great evangelist and preacher as well. In any spare time, he's out preaching the gospel. Um, 
and uh, so we're grateful for what God is doing out there. Such enthusiasm, people catch fire. Uh, there's one boy, Jesse, I knew him when he was six years old when we first went out about 13 years ago. Uh, he's 19 uh, this summer. And uh, uh, he's uh, suddenly, he got saved and he suddenly caught fire, fire, fire and uh, he's sending us little uh, sermons that he's preached and he's going around evangelizing and preaching in churches. It's wonderful to be a part of uh, a work that is that is where something is happening and things are taking off. So thank you so so much for your part in that because God is blessing the work and everything that you you have contributed, everything that you've helped with and, and your prayers uh, go towards uh, something incredible. And we are so thankful, so very grateful uh, for your interest. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness has.
Mark chapter 13 verse 32 to 37 No one knows the day or hour. No one knows, however, when the day or hour will come. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father knows. Be on watch, be alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It will be like a man who goes away from a home on a journey and leaves his servants in charge after giving to each one his own work to do and after telling the doorkeeper to keep watch, be on guard. Then, because you do not know when the master of you, the house is coming, it might be in the evening or midnight, or before dawn, or at sunrise. And if he comes suddenly, he must not find you asleep. What I say to you, then I say to all, watch. Hello, and welcome to our 100th Sunday online talk for the 23rd of January, 2022. Our subject for the last two weeks has been lifting up the Son of Man. This is part three, obviously. Um, attempts to bring down the Son of Man. I'll explain that in a moment. Poor messengers in particular. It's the third part, as I say, of a series. The first one we said, well, now what does it mean? The Son of Man being lifted up. It refers to the crucifixion of Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And then enabling him to draw everybody to him from the world, from sin, and, and to save them because he is a substitute for their sin. And it also refers, though, to lifting him up visibly so that people may see the gospel and even his exaltation into heaven, even though it took him out of earth where he could be seen with the ordinary eyes into heaven. Nevertheless, from there, he sends the Holy Spirit and through the gospel message preached by the church, through the, the, the grace and power of the Spirit, he's seen, it becomes visible that he is the Saviour and that he draws people to him because he is, he's taken their sin. Um, the second one was attempts to bring down the Son of Man in the sense of making him less visible, in other words, changing the message, and that was the subject, changing the message, a wrong message. And this week it's about the messengers, those who preach the gospel, uh, poor messengers, I've called it, as something that can, as it were, bring down the visibility of the Son of Man and his purpose for people. The Son of Man, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, God who became a man. Firstly, three problems for poor messengers. Secondly, three answers to those problems for the poor messengers. And then thirdly, those same answers applied to people who are not yet messengers. Firstly, three problems for, for, for poor messengers. Cowardice and laziness and unbelief. Now, no one likes to be called a coward. I do not. It's not a nice word. Um, but in these days, there is in the West, an increasing antipathy to the gospel, to the Bible message. I was reading recently uh, concerning that uh, statue of Edward Colston that was removed from its plinth in Bristol and lovingly placed in the harbour by protesters in June 2020. Um, it can be, that, that, that statue can be viewed, I think it's lying down in a glass case with the graffiti still on it, can be viewed by appointment, and you, it's part of a tour, a conducted tour, and you'll be taken to it, among other things, in, in the museum, a museum in Bristol. But what made it interesting to me is what a volunteer guide who had previously conducted a tour, including the statue, said. And this is what he said, or she said. I've been given a long list of things I can and can't say, so I'm not going to say anything at all. 
That's how to keep out of trouble, isn't it? Do you blame him? Huh? Um, what we say now, even if it's at the moment acceptable, you know, political correctness, it, it may become unacceptable quite soon, next year, the year after, even 10 years on, and anything, maybe we've put it online or what we said is remembered in some way. Um, it, it can then be used against us. And there can be public humiliation, can be the loss of job, uh, all sorts of things. So what is the safe option to do what this unpaid guide did? Don't say anything. So here's your guided tour. We come to the statue, shtum, nothing. This kind of chilling effect, some people call it, you're curbing your own speech. You're being your own big brother because of the message that we understand is or may be soon what everyone is supposed to think and say. So I will guard my own language, my own thinking in effect, um, accordingly. Well, now think about the Christian message, which begins by saying every single person is wrong. That's good, isn't it? That's going to make us popular. The word is repent, change your mind on that basis. Morally, you're wrong. And the way you think of getting right, getting it right, if you once you've accepted that you are wrong. There's only one way, and that is, of course, Jesus Christ. That's unacceptable too. One way. Think of all the cultures and religions and so on and so forth that that contradicts. Well, what's the sensible thing to do? Don't talk about it. Keep it to yourself. Have your religion in your own heart and mind and don't share it or try and impose it on anyone else. The only sensible thing, well, apparently Jesus was not sensible, if that's the definition of sensible. Let me read you what he said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 26. He said, whoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, my teaching, my gospel, of him shall the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. Talking about the moment when he returns to this earth and everybody uh, appears before him. He will be embarrassed by people who have been embarrassed by him and what he said and have kept quiet about it. And that's how it will be. It's an interesting, to say the least, interesting and terrifying list of people who miss out on God's blessing. It's found in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. It's called the second death. It includes spiritual death as well as physical death. And it's, it's the picture is of a, a, a lake of fire with people. Like their lives are completely ruined and waste. They're just refuse terrible horrible picture and there's a terrible list of uh, awful evils but at the top of the list there are cowards now having said that when we present the gospel message we're not meant to court trouble and try and be offensive in the way we present it of course not we must be very careful and sensitive and so on but in as much as the message itself can cause offence, I'm afraid we've got no choice. If we're Christians, that we must make no. And many Christians are too afraid to do it. They're frightened to lift the Son of Man, which is the one vision that people need. Secondly, laziness. Um, I was thinking of the, the new habits that have necessarily, to some degree, I mean, maybe some are necessary, some haven't been. Christians have varying convictions about the, the shades of, you know, how to uh, react in detail. But obviously these restrictions have altered the way we do things. Um, uh, attendance at meetings, even conversations with people that we may have had you know, what with masks and not going out so much and so on, become more difficult. Well, it's a sign of spiritual health 
in a Christian, that they actually pray to their father, Lord today, Father today, give me opportunities to, to represent you, to speak for you, and then to be actively looking for the answer to that, those prayers. And maybe the, the circumstances in some ways have mitigated against that. I'm not just talking about official church arrangements and outreach programs and so on, but just the, the attitude I have. People need this message, I must share it. And how sad if the, the new situation and any other reason, excuse I suppose, is taken and just simply I'm not going to be bothered anymore. Maybe I can't do things this way. Maybe there's other ways. But too lazy to actually say to a person, look, this is the way to heaven. And the third thing is unbelief. Um, a lack of conviction about what God says. You know, why bother to lift Jesus up to people? Why bother to share the gospel? What's the point? There's so little response. God is going to save who he's going to save anyway and that's with or without me and things are just getting too difficult now I'll, I'll just concentrate on maintaining my faith and uh, maybe just associating and helping and encouraging other Christians you can't maintain your faith without where possible sharing the gospel that is in itself a denial of the faith so there's that lack of conviction but also lack of obedience because Jesus said preach the gospel share chat it our old pastor used to say gossip the gospel that is part of faith is obedience to the conviction that I should do what God says unbelief and those three things, there may be other things, I'm not saying that there are not, but those three things can very easily lead to the Son of God, the Son of Man, not being lifted up. I'm too frightened to do it. I'm too lazy to do it. And I don't believe that it will really do anything. Well, three answers to those poor messengers. Courage. For cowardice, courage. Not just be, be courageous, full stop. Let me quote the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 6 verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You have the resources of Almighty God at your disposal. And in Hebrews chapter 13, the Lord says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I'll never give up on you. I will not so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He wouldn't stay with us if it wasn't to help us. And I will not fear. I will not be a coward. What man shall do to me? What he will do to me? Not just how he will react to me, whatever. I won't fear that. We can be courageous, legitimately, because of the presence and help of God himself. Industry for laziness. The New Testament part of the Bible, the latter part of the Bible, with the fullest revelation of God's purpose for us, speaks of a working church. People who have been received the gospel, called out, and they become God's people. And they're working people. I don't mean they go to work, they earn their money. And, I mean they work for the Lord Jesus. The Bible does not know of any other kind of church. There isn't any other kind of church. There's an interesting parable in Mark chapter 13 where the Lord Jesus, I won't go into the details, but he, it says to, he gives everyone his own work to do before he returns. He gives them a charge, goes away, and then he returns, thinking of his, the moment of his return to see how they got on. Everyone has their work. In another similar kind of parable in Luke chapter 19, um, the, 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 the word in the authorised version was occupy till I come. And our old pastor used to say that a lot. It just means do business until I come. It, it's a parable. In other words, get on with the work I've given you until I return. 
we're not working, doing these things in order to be saved or to be accepted by God, but rather we're doing them because we have been accepted by God, because we are saved. We're saved by faith, not by our own works. But then, of course, that principle of faith, trusting in God, means we do what's called works of faith, as James calls it in his epistle. Um, so, so even if you go back to the, the days of creation, where God on six consecutive days does the work and then rests on the last day, on the Saturday, calls it a Sabbath, on that basis, uh, the Ten Commandments, one of them is six days you'll labour and do all your work. Seventh is the Sabbath, the cessation of the Lord your God. Um, yes, we're here to work. And if that applies to creation generally, it certainly applies to Christians. Too lazy. Well, let's work for the Lord if we are Christians. And in, in our chapel window, there was a display um, put up um, at the front and part of it was Christmas and part of it was like a, a, a hearth scene in a home. And, and now the Christmassy bit has been replaced by John 3, chapter 16, uh, John, John chapter 3, verse 16, maybe the most well-known verse in the Bible. It looks very attractive, especially at night time when people are passing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wonderful. Wonderful. That is the Christmas message as well, by the way, but it's the gospel message. Um, I, I can't promote the gospel in this way. Why don't I do it this way? Thank God for those who've got the initiative and the ability to do that. Working for Jesus. Who knows what that may achieve? In fact, I was very challenged in our prayer meeting recently on a Monday evening when reference was made in prayer to, to that display. And, uh, you know, Lord, we can't do so and so and so and so, the normal thing. Would you use it and bring the truth to people? Words to that effect, they're my words, they're not the words that was. I was deeply challenged by that. I said, Amen. And may the Lord do it and bring people to himself through that display. He can do that. He can do anything. Um, reference was made to the fact that we haven't got a youth meeting at the moment since this COVID business. And, and you know, the, the prayer was made, Lord, you can do it. We can't see how, but you can do it. That's right. Faith, not unbelief. Believe God and what he says. Three answers to poor messages. But also those same three answers to people who are not yet messengers. You see, if you are a Christian, if you come to Christ, you become his disciple, you've been saved by him, you've put your faith in him, you obey him, we become his messenger. If you like his angel, we talk for him. We represent him in actions, but in words. And the good news is part of that, lifting him up before people. He has been lifted up in the sense of he's died for them. He's been exalted into heaven. But we lift him up locally to show people. Well, if you haven't yet become one of those people, well, take courage. Um, there is a cost to following Jesus and you will need courage. If we think back to that... Um, there's that story in the, in the wilderness that Jesus applied to himself where the people of Israel, many of them had complained against God, got bitten by snakes and were dying. And the answer given by God was to put up a snake, uh, a brazen brass or copper bronze snake on a pole and take it around and everyone who looked would, would live. Jesus said, that's a picture of me. Whoever looks to me, believes on me in the same way that the serpent was lifted in the wilderness, even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up? Whoever believes on him, trusts him, wouldn't perish but have eternal life. The death that was brought about by sin would be removed. And you say, well, what's the cost involved there? You just look or you die. Well, that's true. But to believe on Jesus 
means that you may have a loss of reputation. Some people may look down on you, think you're stupid or even evil. Your popularity may sag, may not, <laughs> may increase with some, but it can definitely do that. Your career even may be in jeopardy. There may be financial considerations, ways in which you would be worse off. It's possible. People have lost their jobs. And it's happening even in the West now. Need, to, need a bit of courage. He'll help you. He'll save you. He'll keep you. Of course he will. But you still need a bit of courage. Maybe a bit of hard work too, a bit of industry. Have you been too lazy, dare I ask, to look at the validity of the many objections to Christianity? You know, all the Bibles, a lot of fables, fairy stories, science has disproved it. We've evolved beyond the need for religion now. And all that the plethora of um, objections, which are all nonsense and have been very well answered. You won't think of one that hasn't been already thought of and answered. And they can relatively easily be found probably online, together with all the nonsense. You've got to sort through it, of course. It may be that there is a testimony in today's meeting or in a future meeting, which will be an example of someone's search to see that Christianity was actually valid. They wanted to be, that person wanted to be sure. Well, don't be too lazy to discover if heaven and hell and the Son of Man taking your sin and changing you and removing hell for you and bringing you to life and blessing in heaven to see if it's true or not. For goodness sake, it should take precedence over some other things and just being too lazy to do it. Faith. Um, faith is partly, as I say, that conviction that I know this is true. That's part of it. Maybe you've, I don't know if you've listened to us before, others, and, and in, in your mind, the Christian message is beginning to, you're beginning to say, I, these people have got something. You know, I think it's true. I think he, the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, is true. Well, that's the conviction. That's good as far as it goes, but it won't help you at all unless you act on it. I know I need bread. We've run out. Well, great. Go and get some. You need to act on the belief, the understanding. Uh, look and live. Well, that would have been easy for those people, wouldn't it? The, the, the alternative was die. But even, even there, they had to kind of acknowledge, I'm, I'm wrong, I need help outside of myself. Even there, a certain cost. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. The Son of Man, Jesus himself, has to be lifted up as a sin offering. And from there I will draw people to myself. But whoever believes on him, trusts him, puts their trust entirely in him. They will not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me just suggest a short prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus, I trust you. You are qualified to save me. You died to take my sin in my place. You, the perfect one. And now you live and are willing to receive me. You want me. You are qualified and you are willing to save me. I now put myself entirely into your hands. Please save me. I now trust you and receive eternal life. Amen. sorrows. What a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah! What a 
again we're going to close in prayer we thank you our father for sending your son the lord jesus to be our savior thank you that he was lifted up for us we give you thanks we ask now for your blessing if we are those who love you would you inspire us to lift him up to our family, our friends, in the area we are. Give us grace, wisdom, power to do this. And for any who do not yet love you, Lord, meet them now. Meet them now and save, we pray. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon all those who have believed on the Son of Man lifted up and thereby receiving eternal life. Amen. Amen.